Welcome. Shh. Hey guys. Hey. Uh, welcome to Mobile Monday, uh, April 2015. Um, tonight we'll be talking about satellite imagery, mapping, um, and how that affects mobile's experiences. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about big data and geodata, um, and see also that how, how that helps experiences and how that can, um, you know, be it as additional feature sets, how that can improve. Uh, engagement as well as um, the overall consumer experience. So um, my name is Mario Tapia. I am uh, uh, president of Mobile Monday here in Silicon Valley. Um, how many people tonight? This is the first first night at a Mobile Monday. Um, how many people are in, in, in geo geospatial technologies? How many people are app developers? Oh, cool. How many people have apps in their uh, maps in their apps? today. How many people don't but would like them? <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're a nonprofit here in Silicon Valley um, with uh, a large, at least in the U.S., we have a large reach um, over a dozen cities. So uh, there's probably 30 meetups just like this going on around the, around the world on a Monday night uh, with a bunch of folks just like you in the mobile ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um, we're 140 cities uh, worldwide, so when you travel, how many people have been to Mobile Monday in a different city? How about a different country? Wow, so awesome. So uh, definitely a large, you guys are large, a part of a very, very large open community. So when you guys are traveling, there's, there's a, when I, I was just in Israel two weeks ago, and got to, went to Nazareth, and there was a Mobile Monday in Nazareth, and I went to Tel Aviv, and there was a Mobile Monday in Tel Aviv, so it's been a really fun experience. Um, to travel the globe and actually to meet people that are mobile entrepreneurs or are really into mobile just as I am. Um, here in the Valley, um, we are now, the count is over 17,000. Um, uh, but it always, interestingly enough, kind of works in the same uh, same way. Uh, about a third of you are developers. How many people are developers actually write the code? So. Business development, sales. Who's product and marketing? Same cool. All right, see, so, oh, designers. Are there any designers here? See, yeah, see, the, the three unicorns. So, um, so, uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much our demographic breakdown. Uh, there's bloggers and media, um, but most of it is are really the people behind the industry making things happen. Uh, and you can't do this alone. Um, uh, I have uh, a lot of other helpers. We also have uh, John, who's, who, our historian, but he's more of our BD guy as well, is in the back. So we have over 60 of these events on YouTube, and I can just kind of show you where to find them later. Um, so it does take a village to put this whole thing together. Um, we do have a monthly meetups. Um, uh, we, this is our monthly topic, by the way, and we do have another one that's special because of RSA. So we have, we have a cybersecurity one that's a little smaller tomorrow night. We have the head of security for AT&T, um, and then a lot of the local uh, well, we have, uh, uh, public liaison for the private sector for Homeland Security and, um, and peppered in with a, a bunch of local cybersecurity, mobile cybersecurity startups. Um, so that if you guys are interested, let me know or just um, you can also take a look at meetup.com. We'll have more information about that. Um, we also do Mobile Monday Labs. How many of you guys have been to a Mobile Monday Lab? You guys write code? Great. Um, and then we do um, our CXO dinners, so this is more of a, a roundtable discussion around a certain topic. And then um, almost on a quarterly basis, we do something called Mobile University, and that's like a one-day event and a deep dive in a certain technology. Um, here's a list of a lot of our corporate partners. Um, this is where to find us um, on Meetup. Most of us found us on Meetup, probably, um, but we're, we're like in five different places. Um, on Twitter, you can find us at Momo SV, Facebook, Mobile Monday SV, YouTube. So if you're looking for the, the past events, everything's pretty much recorded. Um, you can find it on Mobile Monday SV. Um, but also, I'd like to thank our sponsors for tonight, uh, Digital Globe, for making this happen. Give them a round of applause, everybody. And, uh, and, and Microsoft for this awesome place. Isn't this AV today? Um, also, I'd like to thank, um, outside there's a couple of tables, and I'd like to thank Indoor Atlas. They're, uh, they're also a startup um, in, indoor location. So they give you the blue dot 
uh, as, as opposed to being outdoors, we have the blue dot. They give you the blue dot on the inside. Um, so check them out afterwards. They'll they'll be out here and, and at the table. Um, Localizer, basically uh, using big data, a big data play on location information. Uh, Aloha Mobile, check-in data, and also Transcast. They're out here in the back. So if you guys, um, these are all startups that are um, uh, basically have uh, something to show you and a conversation to have. And, um, and I have, we have a special announcement uh, as a request from Microsoft, and that's about the uh, mobile ecosystem forum. Is it? The, they changed from entertainment. Okay. Then we have uh, Natalia come on up, and she has a couple of words to talk about it. And yeah. So, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Natalia Irokina. I'm uh, the general manager in Mobile Ecosystem Forum North America. Um, short math, um, Microsoft uh, sits on our board and uh, they invited me to say a couple of words today about our association and introduce it to you, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, so uh, we are a global trade body uh, with headquarters in London, UK and regional chapters in Asia, Latin America, EMEA and of course here in North America and we are uh, members of association and we support uh, the interests of our members coming from today's ever-evolving diversity uh, of um, global mobile ecosystem. Uh, so, uh, our association includes Fortune 500 companies and also, uh, equally importantly, uh, small, smaller companies which uh, find new opportunities to market and um, uh, possibilities to collaborate on product development. Uh, we host um, more than 20 events worldwide, including Math Global Forum, which takes place here in the Bay Area, specifically in San Francisco, uh, every year in November. And starting this year, we rebranded, as Mario noticed, and uh, we also have a Math Global Forum in Bangalore, India, focused on emerging markets and innovations and monetization. And uh, finally, also Math leads initiatives. Uh, to support the growth of the mobile industry. For example, current initiatives we have are consumer trust, mobile money, uh, bus regulation, and um, innovation program which provides access to mobile accelerators and um, emerging startups in this area. So uh, this is a short overview of MEF. Uh, thank you, Mario, for giving me uh, an opportunity to say a few words. And we have a table also in the back. And I invite you to drop by and learn more about potential involvement. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And uh, thanks again to Microsoft Silicon Valley, to Mobile Mondays, and I have you. I hope you have a great evening. Um, so let's get on the program. I'm gonna uh, call up Shai from from Digital Glow, and he's doing uh, work for the product there. He has a couple of uh, slides to show you. Thanks, Mario. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Thanks for having me, everybody, and welcome. Uh, it's pretty exciting to see such a turnout from such diverse backgrounds. So um, I want to share with you some thoughts. So um, I want to talk about big data, clouds, geo, mobile, and a whole bunch of other buzzwords right, that we can throw together. Uh, seriously, my title my business card is Senior Director of Geospatial Big Data. But what does this mean, and how does this connect to the mobile environment? Um, so maps, right? So this is a map of the, I took a screenshot of it. It's actually an interactive map. It's an interactive map of the availability of primary care. Um, here's another map of the disposable income spent on gas. There's so much information going on inside of here. And if you were actually to look at the, at the, uh, at the interactive one, you could zoom in. If you knew exactly where you were looking, you could zoom in and get a ton of information. But it's not just about getting more information onto a map. It's not just squeezing more stuff and putting it in a smaller area. So Gunderson's going to hate me for this one. Maps kind of suck. Or is it that dumb maps suck? So the point here is not to squeeze more into a smaller area, but the goal is to give the contextually relevant information to the user when the user needs it. So I like to call this, instead of show me there, to show me where, right? Instead of, if you know exactly where to look, this problem's been solved. We have geo-nerds around the world that have been solving this for years. But what if you don't know where to look? 
What if you just need the highly relevant information that you need to give to your user? So I would like to, uh, to throw out there that mobile needs exactly this type of insight. It requires simplicity, but the phone that you're walking around with in your pocket provides the context that allows that simplicity. So this is a fact and figure from IBM. Um, I don't actually know what exactly it means, but every day we create about two and a half quintillion bytes of data. That's a lot of zeros. Ollie, you're at Google now. How many zeros is that? He's got, I've got him. <laughs> it's a lot of zeros. I don't actually know what it means. But 90% of the data in the world has been created in the last two years alone. Now, the challenge is that none of your users want to zoom in into any given byte of data. It's not about any given byte of data. It's about understanding the entirety and highlighting the relevant. So at Digital Globe, we have this problem. Um, every day, we collect about 3.5 million square kilometers of imagery every single day. That's, and Luke, this is your math now. 13.2 gazillion pixels every single day. It's about 60 to 70 terabytes every single day. Now, the challenge here is that nobody actually wants to download all that data. The opportunity is just to mine it for the relevant information. So this is actually what it looks like. So these are a collection over the last three days. So each of these um, little orange things is a collection we took over the last three days. And you can see it's pretty global, right? Satellites are going around the globe, um, taking pictures. Um, this is what it looks like over the last two weeks, the last three months. 70 terabytes a day. It's ridiculous how much information is locked inside there. And guess what? Nobody's looking at any of this data. By large, 98, 99, I'm just making up this number now, but most of the data does not go, on, it does not go analyzed. There's a huge opportunity here for exploitation to convert all these pixels to information. And that's exactly what my job is. So that's what we're trying to do at Digital Globe, is trying to provide much more access to this data to make it more available for scalable analysis. So there's a few folks I know in the room that are already doing that, that are already tapping into that. And so, again, remember the context of show me where. So show me where the remote dwellings are located so that I could distribute vaccines or distribute medication in the most effective way possible. We had a big response actually to the Ebola outbreak uh, six months ago, something like that. <coughs> show me where all the vehicles are. We actually have a, a customer, a partner, that's identifying where the traffic jams are so that they can figure out how to monetize billboards better. <laughs> Show me where all the new construction is. Now, for a mobile user, it's not about show me where all the new construction is. It's show me where the nearest construction is. And trying to make it very relevant to that user. That's the challenge that we're engaged in. And that's the opportunity. There's another really cool, unique aspect of mobile and geo and how they go together. So I talk about these, these fancy pants um, uh, satellites in space that are orbiting the globe, taking pictures. But it turns out these things are sensors as well, right? So I love this visualization. This is a, a visualization courtesy of CardoDB showing um, the Twitter stream during the Real Madrid and the Atletico Madrid championship game. Um, as you can see, this is what happens as the goal, uh, as the score uh, in the game is going on. So, you know, at some point, I think they score a goal, Atletico scores a goal, and then, wait for it, wait for it, goal! <laughs> During the next World Cup, I recommend switching to Telemundo whenever they actually score, score a goal. It's much more exciting. Um, but actually, I want to do one of these things. Wait for it. Awesome. I'm just taking a picture of everybody so I can tweet it. Cool. <laughs> The opportunity here is to leverage each one of these things and combine it with other data sets. So if we don't take advantage, advantage of, these, is, of these live streaming data sources, we're actually missing a lot of the information. We're leaving a lot of data on the table. If you want to follow me on my heart crowds. So this is what we're doing to move, at Digital Globe, this is what we're doing to move beyond data snacking. Is what I, this actually, um, I, I stole that, that term from, uh, uh, from the former, or actually, the CEO of GNIP, uh, now part of Twitter. Uh, I think you refer to one of their competitors as, if you're interested in data snacking, just go to one of them. But if you're really ready to consume data, come to us. Um, it's along the same lines. Moving beyond data snacking applications. So here's why it's hard. Processing terabytes of high resolution, multi-band imagery requires a ton of storage and compute. So um, 
Does anybody here have bandwidth at their house? 70 terabytes? Uh, yeah, they, no, I don't know what that, I should figure out what that is in gigabits per second. I don't actually know what that is, but it's a lot. Okay, nobody wants to download it. So we build a cloud platform to be able to ingest this data and to bring the compute to the data rather than the data to the compute. It's fundamentally critical for advanced use cases. And then number two, it's really expensive. So if you're buying data as an asset, if you're buying it one kilometer at a time, large scale processing is way too expensive. That's the equivalent of paying a nickel per tweet and trying to understand what the Twitter stream is telling you, right? It doesn't make any sense for these cost applications. So what we're working on is we're working with partners and we're working directly to create these advanced processing tiers to allow this large scale processing. So stay tuned for more on that. Suppose you're a retailer that wants to open up a new store. First, you'd look at the globe, highlighting your successful stores and unsuccessful stores. Looking at these areas, you can dig into the customer base. What are the conditions of their neighborhoods? Are their yards well kept? How many cars are in the driveway? What's the square footage of their house? You might then look at the towns as a whole. How many houses are there? Have the towns been experiencing growth? How many cars are there total? Have the economic centers been moving or developing? You can see how as the picture grows, from a neighborhood, to a town, to a state, or even a country, you start to get more information. Intuitively, you could guess that the locations with the nice lawns or nice cars are experiencing growth and would be more attractive. But let's let the data speak for itself. So these are the sorts of big data correlations that I'm talking about. Now, this might all sound like buzzwords, right? And um, Peter Thiel actually made a comment about this the other day. He said, if you hear in the pitch the words cloud computing, big data, machine learning, just get away as fast as you can. He's basically talking about the idea of hype and trends and how they're all overrated. And I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Notice I didn't stand up here talking about hives and storms and sparks and all this stuff, right? It's not about the technology. It's about the application. It's about solving the end user's problem. And so I put together kind of a few thoughts. And they're probably wrong. And I'm, happy, I'm glad we have a panel on here, up here. I'm actually glad I'm not on the panel. Um, but here are the opportunities. Number one, companies are opening up their data sets more and more. So Digital Globe is doing it, Twitter is doing it, CoreLogic is doing it, the number of government entities, there's more and more data available for exploitation. Number two, the technology problem has been solved. Right? We've had a ton of investments. Most of the VC investments in the data space has been around moving, has been on moving bits around about processing bits, making it much more, much faster. And I'm specifically not mentioning any specific technologies because it kind of doesn't matter. They each have their place. There's a ton of opportunity for investment applications. So there's this really cool quote that spoke to me from Dan Ariely. He said, big data is like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks that everyone else is doing it. So everyone claims they're doing it, right? I don't know if you've seen that, but it really spoke to me. It's all about the applications. It's less about technology, and it's more about what you do with it. And then finally, as you're building applications for these things, think personalized, think simple, and think big. And by the way, we're hiring. Um, this is actually an image from the lift. Uh, Luke and I went skiing on, uh, on Saturday. That was two days ago. We had 17 inches of fresh powder. It was an hour away from where our office, an hour and a half away from where our office is. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Shai. That was awesome. Uh, hopefully one day you can share those online. Maybe you can get, share those. Um, so we have Luke Barrington coming up for Digital Glow as well, and uh, he's gonna have an awesome story. As well. Thank you very much. Do you mind asking this? Is this for me? Cool. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Luke, and I also work at Digital Glow. I've been friends with Shai for a long time, but I didn't know him when he was a teenager, so I don't know how true that quote was. <laughs> um, but I'm here to tell you about three adventures. The first is a historical adventure. The second one is an entrepreneurial adventure. And the third one takes us all the way into space. So that's why I'm talking about from startups to space. And our first adventure begins more than 800 years ago when this man, Genghis Khan, died. 
And this is the, the greatest warlord that's ever lived. He had the largest empire that has ever been on the surface of the earth. And when he died, he was campaigning in northern China. And it's thought that, they, that he wanted to be buried back in his homeland in northern Mongolia, and that his body would be bought, brought there to be buried. But when he died, there was secrecy, there was myths, there was intrigue and Game of Thrones action kind of stuff. And no one knows to this day where his final resting place was. So along with some friends in grad school, Shai being one of them, we decided we're going to try and solve this mystery. And so the story fast forwards 800 years to just a few years ago, when Shai and I were riding to school together in San Diego. <laughs> Shai's cut his hair since then, even on the handlebars. Um, and we got a phone call from somebody at Digital Globe. And the guy on the phone said, hey, I read this story about your quest to find Genghis Khan's tomb. Do you guys want some satellite images? We're like, sure, that sounds awesome. Yeah, I don't know. Satellite images, what do we do with those? Yeah, okay, cool. Let's, yeah, let's, yes, please. Um, just you know, send us your API. Let's hook us up to the API, and we'll, we'll get started. And so um, a, few, a few weeks later, we got their API. This was it. <laughs> a crap ton of hard drives showed up you know, from FedEx, right? And we plugged them into our computer, we opened them up, and there was like these 11-bit images that like didn't work in Microsoft Paint. And it was like all these different bands. We're like, what the hell do we do with this? We did, couldn't figure it out. We literally spent weeks running, and we were all PhDs in image science, and we couldn't figure this out. So it took us a long time. But you know, a bit of perseverance and a bit of uh, you know, Google searches, and we figured out how to open a couple of them. And once we did finally open the images, this is what we saw. And it was really a, a gold mine of information. We were going to one of the most remote parts of the world to solve a mystery that had been a geospatial mystery that no one had been able to solve for 800 years. And there was not a single map to tell us how to get there or where to go once we got on the ground. But as soon as you saw these images, straight away we started to see things like roads. So if, you've got, if you're on a horse, knowing where the road is gets, gets you around a lot faster. And better, knowing where the river is keeps the horse happy at the end of the day. And then we started, when we zoomed in though, it got even more interesting. And what we started to see on the surface of the Earth were now shapes, rectangular and circular structures that looked like they could be indicative of, of man-made activity and things could be buried under the Earth. So all these clues started to pour in. But we needed help to identify them. So we put together a website where we asked for the public's help. So anyone could quickly look at this image, and if you've ever used any online mapping site, you'll know how to do this. Just drop a few pins in the map and say, hey, I think some roads are here, and maybe this could be, this is an archaeological thing, I don't know. But one person, you know, what do they know? But when hundreds of people joined us, and then we launched the, the website at nationalgeographic.com, and thousands of people joined us, we started to get some really interesting information. We were able to take an image like this and turn it into a map that looks like this where now the roads just start, and rivers start to jump out immediately, and all of the other dots clustered all around the place were, were people, again, not experts, not GIS people, not remote sensing scientists, nothing like that, but people saw, they saw something. So we got on the plane, got some horses, and went to check these places out. So we took this adventure through the wilds of Mongolia, we climbed up mountains, we launched drones, we scanned underground, and we found this one beside in particular, led, starting by these satellite image clues and following with a, with a bunch of other methods that we think may be the answer to this 800-year-old mystery. But that's a story for another day. But the story that I'm here to tell you about today is what we actually learned there, which was that there is an incredible wealth, which I said, incredible wealth of information contained in these satellite images, right? There's lots to be found in these pixels, like this shot taken the day after the tornado went through downtown Moore, Oklahoma, a few years back. But it's really tough to get that information out, and this is back to Shai's point. And right now, the best thing, in spite of all those APIs and tools that Shai's been talking about, the best tool that we still have these two things right here, right? Uh, human eyes and brains is the best way of extracting information from all these pixels. But one guy by himself, and that was me at the start, is a tough job, right? So bring your friends and get them to bring their friends and see how you can do now. So this is the idea of crowdsourcing. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this in various different applications. So applying crowdsourcing to satellite images is, is the idea, the kind of innovation that we came away with. We use some algorithms and statistical methods to figure out you know, who's smart and who's not, and how do we actually extract reliable information from all of those random people online. That's, that's, the, thesis, that's the thing that's our patent. Um, and we were able to take, again, an image like this, and within minutes, turn it into a map like this, where we now know where all the damaged buildings were minutes after that, that um, image was captured of the, of the devastation. But then it gets really interesting. We start to take that geospatial information you from the pixels and add all these other layers. So think about going on Zillow, pulling all the property values, and now you suddenly know how much an insurance company is on the hook for to pay for the reconstruction of this location. Think about taking all the geotagged social media posts, figuring out where people need help and where you need to distribute the bottled water. It's that uh, amalgamation of all these layers together that actually extracts the information. So that led us to our final innovation. We had an idea, right? We, we'd come through this adventure in history, and now we had an idea, something that could actually be useful for, for ourselves and for, hopefully for others. And so this brings me to Dr. Luke's five simple steps for startup success. The first 
staff that you need. So I, so I was told to tell a startup story here, and I know that some of you guys are, are working on that, so hopefully this will mean something to you. If not, um, I'll be over soon. Um, so we, first thing was you need an idea. Check. Okay. Stage two, we needed a team. Well, we just come back from Mongolia and spent a month living in a tent with a bunch of guys, and we were pretty close now, so we are like, hey, we can do this. So we had Albert, who was the, the connector who knows all the rich, smart people. We had me, who could be the innovator and had done a PhD in crowdsourcing. Shai was the hustler, whether it came making coffee or, or raising funds, he was the guy for the job. And Nate was our hacker, and he's still uh, leading the development of the geospatial big data platform at Digital Club. So we had, the, we had the dream team. The next thing that we needed was passion. So things will go wrong. It will suck. You will work late. And if you're not really, 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 really into it, it's easy to quit. So we literally engraved Tom Knott across our chests for a couple of years and just lived and breathed and died by the startup. Um, I managed to convince these guys to quit their well-paying jobs with, that their wives liked, living in nice neighborhoods, and come and work in a crappy incubator in downtown San Diego for a couple of years. I thought it was an incubator. Um, so check, we got the team. Check, we got the passion. The business model, how are we going to make money out of this thing? So we got a great idea. We're going to use the analysis of imagery to analyze agricultural output and help predict farm yields and you know, where food's going to grow and how to feed the world and solve hunger. And well, what about mining output? Maybe we could like, look at where stockpiles are and help you know, commodity traders predict who's digging and who's selling and who's buying. Or well, maybe the supply chain is better because you've got to know where the ships go and where they drop it off. And the more traffic, the more car use, you know, that would be really good. Well, actually, maybe we resident reach retail sales. That's much better, yeah. We'll look at cars and parking lots and figure out if Walmart's selling more and Target's selling less this month. That might be difficult. What about insurance? Let me get something insurance. Yeah. Um, are there trees close to this house? Does it have a swimming pool? Should you pay a good policy or a cheap? Disasters. That's what we should do. We should look at disasters and like, figure stuff after storms happen and you know where fires are burning and earthquakes. And that, that's definitely how we're going to make lots of money. So yeah, business model. We didn't just have one. We had hundreds of them. It was great. Um, so this this is not the recommended part, by the way. You shouldn't do that. Um, in case you didn't get the sarcasm. Um, so once you've got all those things, then really the last step, and this is it, I mean, it's really easy, five simple steps, um, execution. That's what it's really all about. So over the course of the next couple of years, we applied this crowdsourcing of satellite imagery to a bunch of different applications. So um, one close in our backyard, after the Boulder floods that, uh, about a year back, we were able to extract very rapidly the location of all of the damaged roads and the flooded houses in a place where airplanes weren't allowed to fly because of regulations after the disaster. We helped insurance companies map the building footprints and the square footage and the features of different houses so you can assess both pre and post um, damage, assess the, the, um, the underwriting of the houses. We've looked at uh, oil fields all over the world and measured the fill of tanks as the lids float up and down as the oil gets fuller and emptier. You can figure out where the oil, how much oil is in there and help as, um, traders get an edge. Um, and we helped global development organizations map the location of population across huge areas, whole countries in Africa um, and the Middle East, where we contributed to the eradication of polio from the entire continent of Africa. And one that you guys might have heard of before, so this, we've also looked for airplanes. Um, in the aftermath of the Malaysia 370 flight disappearance, we launched a Tom Nod crowdsourcing campaign to search through imagery over the, some of the suspected crash sites or where the plane could have gone missing. And we asked for people's help to uh, help us solve this problem. And boy, did they help. So over the course of a couple of days, we had more than 8 million people come to the website, tomlet.com, to try and contribute to this search. Almost a million of those signed up with their email address and are now part of our crowd who we engage on a daily basis for new endeavors all the time. So and if you haven't done it before, I invite you to check out tomlet.com. You can sign up if you fancy. Um, and we're, we're doing new campaigns all the time. During the course of this campaign, these people analyzed almost 800 million map views. And a map view for us is one browser screen of full res imagery, so like zoomed all the way in, and we get millions and millions and millions and millions of these. This kind of just shows the power of this crowd. They contributed 15 million clicks, you know, tags on the map that we're able to sift through with all of these um, algorithms to try and figure out where there might actually be something missing. And, you know, in case you didn't know, we didn't find the plane. But um, we found a bunch of other stuff that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but kind of just to illustrate the power, you know, through all of this, we were able to analyze over a million square kilometers of high-rise imagery, right? And this is, again, to Shai's point before, this is like how much you might get through in a year if you had like a team of people working on this, right? And we did it in a, in a couple of days with the help of all these people. At our peak, we were doing about 2x Instagram and um, this daily traffic. It's just tons and tons of data and people and clicking and looking and pixels and analysis. 
one of those people, this is probably the, this is just summarizing, you know, what you get out of your startup is that you're get rid of that in Rolling Stone, then mission accomplished. And that's what those five steps are leading towards. So if you're thinking of any other kind of exit, sorry to disappoint you. Um, but this is Courtney Love, and she was in our crowd. She joined Tom Nod during the search, and she thought she'd found the plane. She tweeted about it and got kind of featured in some press. Um, and this is what Courtney saw. This is the picture that she saw. This is a screenshot from the Tom Nod website that Courtney saw. So she saw it like, this was kind of like, a big, big, big kind of clumpy bit at the top might have been a bit of the fuselage, and then the sort of speckle across the water is like wreckage and bits of debris all strewn across the water, right? Not crazy. I mean, Courtney's no PhD in GIS, but you know, this isn't, isn't totally dumb. And, and, the, and of course, the important thing was hundreds of other people also clicked right here. Right? We wouldn't have just trusted it was Courtney. We would have taken a look, but just because of Courtney. But um, we wouldn't have trusted her. But when hundreds of other people did click here and just got filtered down by our crowd rank algorithm, it's like, well, let's take a look at it. So we sent this location to some of the experts that we do have in house who don't have time to look through those millions and millions of square kilometers, but they can take a look at those top 10, 100,000 results the crowd are pointing them to. And they did some image stretching, enhancing, and rotating, and they came up with this, where now you can sort of see that this is like a ship who's kind of got its flat back and a pointy nose moving through the water, and that speckle was the wake as the ship was passing through the water. So again, not the plane, but in a million square kilometers of nothingness, to be able to zoom in on locations like this, and every single, we found every single ship in the second Indian Ocean over that entire week, um, and every wave, and every rock, and every island, and everything else as well, but um, we're able to identify these important locations. So somewhere during that process, um, Tom Nod was happy to get acquired by Digital Globe, and that's when things really took off. Four, three. Two, we have ignition and we have liftoff of the United So I made this for a talk that I gave at my high school and I was trying to tell the kids to stay in school. So this is why you should stay and keep learning chemistry. And if you're into physics, that's important too. Or maybe applied mathematics is more your thing. But the point being, um, it's not rocket science, right? I mean, it's all different kinds of science added up together. And when it really gets exciting is once those rockets get out of space and they release the satellites. So this is what happens then. So Digital Globe has constellation of MEV4. We just decommissioned one of those guys after 13 years of good service. And every 90 minutes, they do a lap of the Earth. And they're beaming back. They're collecting all of these high-resolution shots of the Earth. So every pixel in the image is about... 50 to 30 centimeters on the ground, so almost the size of one, in fact, one of these chairs, just one pixel of the image. Capturing all this imagery, they're beaming it back down to a network of ground terminals all over the Earth, so like every 15 minutes or so we're in communication with the satellites, that we're telling them where to go next, they're beaming down the data they just shot, and the process continues. Get sent back to our headquarters in Colorado, and that's where the fun part happens, right? That's when everything that Shai described, all of these applications, these analyses, experts looking at it, crowdsourcing happening, that all kind of begins there. That process from <coughs> Space to computer screen, our record I think is 11 minutes, but for me it's a little bit longer than that. But that's that's kind of the, the speed that we're getting to. So not quite real time, but that's what we're aiming for. As we mentioned, there's a crap ton of data, right? So Facebook has billions of little pic photographs. We have lots of big ones. Um, and in our archive now, going back for the more than decade that just goes in business, we've covered the surface area of the Earth like more than eight times over. And actually, we've covered many places much more than that because we tend to focus on the interesting stuff and not so much in the middle of the ocean. And, but it's this time machine for the planet, right? There's pictures in there that go back more than 10 years, right? You could actually see Shai when he's a teenager. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> those are in the archive as well as the stuff that we just captured 11 minutes ago. It's all in there, and it's all ready for analysis. So the big, the really big innovation, like I said, is you know we've got all this data. It just keeps on pouring in. Shai showed you these pictures already. But the point is that it's not hard drives in the mail anymore, right? Since we've been at Digital Globe, the kind of experiences that we went through with Tom and trying to understand how to unlock this, this data and get it out of jail, we've taken that pain that we went through and tried to make it easy for the rest of you and say like, now there's APIs, it's all in the cloud, you just log in and every single pixel is there at your fingertips, whether it's for crunching, so you want it if you're, if you're a, a big data startup or you're a big data company, it's there at your fingertips, if you're a visualization company like Mathbox or Cardo.db, these guys can pull the data and make beautiful online maps so you can present the rest of your data on top of those pixels. But we've taken the pixels out of jail and made it easy for you to take your startup into space next. So that's all I have to say. Thanks very much.
um, I thought you call the panelists up. We'll get to our questions. So I, I had a question. Uh, can you turn those satellites and point them to the moon? Can you turn around and just scan the moon? <laughs> Cool. Um, well, uh, welcome, panel. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'll introductions, and I'll, I guess I'll, I'll start with you, uh, go this in. Basically, just say your name, um, what you do, and uh, who you work for, and how much I care. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Gertz Weber. I work for Nokia here, which is a mapping provider. I work on some of the major accounts in the Valley that we have. And uh, why should we care? Uh, mapping business is a very interesting one with uh, some of the recent news. Um, it's a complicated business, an expensive business to run, and a very important one. So I joined the company about a year ago, and it's been uh, very, very interesting to see some of the evolution and uh, some of the partners, and some of the competitors we talked to. So uh, with that, without further ado, thank you very much. Hello. Yeah, my name is Fred Graham. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Amigo Cloud. Amigo Cloud is a geospatial platform uh, that focuses on data collection with smartphone devices. So mainly GIS, data collection, lines, polygons. Why do we care? Because maps are based on data help collect that data. I am Tyler Bell. Uh, I'm VP of Product at Factual. Hi, I'm Adriana Terzian. Um, I work at Digital Globe, working with some of our different technology accounts. I'm also really excited to be here. I think it's very funny that Luke and Shai both get to speak and then I get to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mark Prelo. I'm the managing director of, as you can see, Prelo Advisors, which is, Advos is like advice, but more expensive. <laughs> and I've been in the uh, geospatial business for 20 years, and in answer to your question, for 10 of those, actually no one really cared. Um, and I, you know, they walk away from me at dinner parties and things like that. But, but in the last 10 years, it's gotten pretty interesting, and I um, sort of do a lot of advising uh, in the uh, location business. Yes, I'm an engineer, so my spelling is uh, that's. <laughs> but uh, but I know. Um, I mean, you guys are very lucky. The panel. I mean, I've known Mark maybe 15 years when I was at Zeitpoint TCS and he was at Decarta way back in the day. I've known Tyler from Yahoo um, when he was basically headed up the strategy about mapping and and local and stuff like that way back in the day. No one escapes the business. Right? Yeah. So I, I, I well, I got locationed out. So I I, I started early 2000 to look. Did a location company for you know, basically to get X Y. We must have spent billions on trying to get that little blue dot, right? <laughs> and now it's like this five dollar chip set that gives you blue dot like that. But um, but there's a lot of um, uh, experience I think here on the panel and and, and understanding to have been through the trenches uh, with this industry and. And so um, when I team up, we team up with Digital Globe to do this. I mean, exactly like here's some. You, well, one, if you can't have a location panel without Mark, <laughs> and if you want to have big data, you have that Tyler. So, um, so definitely, and I think Adriana has some great we're experience. Charge more, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, uh, I was, we were trying to get Mark Davis on this one, so that is more interesting. <laughs> but, um, but I, what I, what I wanted to go to is like you know. A little bit about tonight is about um, how satellite imagery and, and big data and information can enhance experiences when it comes to application development. Um, I think there's a there's a there's a good story behind it. Um, you know, given the fact that you know there's Digital Globe's position with access to large amounts of information, but also does all the heavy lifting for app developers um, and providing them API services um, to allow um, two guys in the garage get access, right? And, and obviously, I think uh, 
Luke and Shai were two guys in the garage <laughs> uh, for, for quite a while having ramen for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But, um, but, uh, but I wanted to at least get a couple of questions, I guess, from, from, from an experienced uh, panel. Um, so uh, last week I was hearing someone from Google Now talk about the intent, right? Google's all about intent. Um, so when, when you open up a mapping app, there's huge intent, right, when you open up an app. It's like I open up uh, Google Maps or uh, Yahoo or et cetera, um, there's a huge intent that goes along with it, and what is that going to be? I need to be someplace, I need to find something, I need to get some information. Um, and so, um, so when someone opens up the map, you know, there's strong intent for the action. You know, how can apps leverage the same intent by integrating imagery, maps, et cetera? Um, and what are some good examples? Like, you know, basically it's like, you know, what's out there that, that you use probably, you know, on a daily basis that has that same effect as, as a mapping app? <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take the warm-up lap for this crowd here. Um, so, uh, uh, in, intent is, um, well, I, I guess I'd step it back and I'd say, really, to, there's, there's been a general trend on the technology sector across basically all, all slices and flavors of tech, which is towards personalization. Uh, many years ago, seven years ago, we were all looking at the same home pages for all the different sites. And then increasingly new services came online that gave you your own personalized view of a specific slice of data. And it's most apparent, of course, in social media where you see things that uh, specifically you want to see. And that was quite a drastic uh, change from the traditional static web page, the Yahoo homepage, say, that everybody saw in 1995. So, working towards intent, or, and this is topical because really what we're talking about is context. The idea is how uh, app developers and publishers can better understand who the consumers are, not as a class, but actually as individuals. And so, a, a, a massive component of that is geographic context. Not just the immediate geographic context that the user is in right now when they engage with your app, but actually historical contexts as well. How can I, as an app developer, build a contextual profile and a contextual understanding of my user based upon where they've been? And obviously the, the data and the imagery and, uh, and, and geospatial content we've seen tonight plays a massive role in that. I don't need that up. So like, it's okay, so basically not just, besides the eye candy that you get, I mean, there's, these images are very rich, right? They have lots of detail, very rich. But then there's also that overlay of invisible data. You can say that could be quant quant quantitative. Exactly. Right? I'm sort of I'm, I'm skipping over the the sort of ephemeral aspects and saying there's there's a whole bunch of semantic data that is extracted from where people are and the things that are around them, and this comes from a boatload of mm -hmm. different sources, including the imagery, but also you know coverages of retail, um, weather, uh, and most of it is tied into location. Mark. Yeah, so I was going to add to that. I, I, um, I very much agree with what you're saying in terms of being personalized and being specific. I think that what a lot of people are trying to do is find out more about the users, but then they want to go on that journey with the user. So if we kind of tie it back to mobile, we're here today to talk about, I think there's pretty consistently you see um, numbers out there about 50% of people, when they're going somewhere, they stop along the way. And so if you're developing an app or you're trying to know more about your user, it's not just who they are in a static moment, but how it is that they're developing over time. And so how do you help them make those decisions from when they walk out to the door to wherever it is they're eventually going to land? Um, and I think that you know being able to walk with that user along the way and not just understand what they've done, but help them figure out where they want to go, um, I think is a, a really important part about um, really leveraging and taking advantage of that intent, that action. Because it's actually several actions along the way. So one of the things that started, you know, as Tyler was saying, it used to be that you you um, ask a question on a map, you put something in the little thing, and we'd all see the same thing. So I'd see the same thing as Adriana would, as Tyler would, and, and everyone would see the same thing. And one of the things they're starting to do now is to really try and understand what you want to see. So a real good example of this, um, you know, if you look at like Airbnb, and, and I was in Washington D.C. last week, and I want to find an Airbnb in Washington. 
DC. Well, that could mean I want to be in Georgetown. It may mean I want to be in Arlington. It may be I want to be in DuPont Circle or some other, you know, who knows where in DC. That's valuable information. If they know that when I say Washington, DC, I really mean Georgetown or Foggy Bottom or something like that, then they start showing me stuff like that. And, and they get that from my clicks. Where, where I look, when I look at DC, where do I zoom in? Uh, same way on travel, you know, what are the things I look at and how, did that, how does that build into some profile so they know what to show me versus Tyler or, or anyone else. And, and I think that in the last couple of years has been one of the bigger evolutions in a lot of these maps that you see. So it's kind of context, right? Information that has context to... Yeah, and history and, and, and really starting to, um, you know, you're starting to see this. And, and if you think about like a street, I, you know, I live um, up the road here in Palo Alto, and you think about um, like University Avenue in Palo Alto, five people driving down University Avenue, if you ask them what's on that street, will give you five different answers. Because there's some things that I care about and some things that you care about, other things my wife's going to care about. I don't want to see stuff that other people care about. I want to see the stuff I want to know. So how do you know that? And that's, I think, one of the biggest things that, that people have started to do from, you know, extracting that data from the map. So I have a, another question is, like, what would happen, what would Yelp Hotel Tonight and, like, Uber, even Airbnb, what would they be like without mapping, without imagery, et cetera? What would those experiences be like? <laughs> like it's like 1996. A couple of them about the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's curious. I mean, I asked the panel, and like, it's an open question, but uh, your favorite, you know, your favorite application without a lot of this data, you know, what would the experiences be like? They definitely Yelp. I think Yelp changed Yellow Pages when by adding one feature set and adding a map to it, and then they added reviews and stuff. So. What I would say is I would make a distinction between all the startups that you just mentioned there. I think uh, um, normally when we think about just GIS data and geospatial data and imagery, we think about the traditional GIS, GIS data sets. That means like this is an image of right now, you know, you can improve it. It's mainly a static view yeah. of something, right? It's an image and it doesn't change. Now, the exciting stuff that we're seeing right now is that things are changing and getting updated constantly, right? And so. From those startups that you mentioned, Uber is an interesting case because it, it's not that we couldn't do before, like, you know, tell me where the closest taxis to me are. Is that now when I go and I ask for a taxi, it's like, or, or you know, a ride, it's actually showing me exactly where it is. And it, it may be like, you know, from a technical standpoint, it may be something very simple, but just the fact that now I'm like, you know, looking at the map and you know, I know exactly where the guy is turning because it's streaming data, about, right? It's like, it's, it's streaming geospatial data. It's not just the static point where like it would show me every five minutes. And I think what you start seeing a lot now is that there's a lot of geospatial data sets that are in streaming mode. Like when you talk about imagery, imagery is constantly changing. When you talk about like location of something, it's location that is constantly changing. I think that's really exciting. What, uh, so what kind of vertical would benefit from, from geodata? If it's something that doesn't, probably doesn't have it today, but what could benefit from it? We've seen re real estate, we've seen a lot of what, e commerce. I mean, what, what's, there's, somebody, there's probably verticals out there that aren't really utilizing or, or have it, but I'm just curious to see if you guys have any thoughts. Um, well, I think there's some things that are kind of obvious but haven't actually yet been done, I think, to the extent that they could be. So if you look at sort of some of the traditional players today, whether we're talking about um, in the social space, whether we're talking about, you know, the big name players, whether it's the Facebook or the Twitter, um, all, all those different, um, different networks out there have people connecting across the globe around topics, around um, things that are of interest to them. And it's, it's interesting to me that we haven't yet seen those groups um, really embrace the map as much as they should be, um, in the sense that, that that map owns so much information about their users that they really need to, they really need to have it, and they don't want to be giving it away to somebody else. And today, that is, in a lot of cases, where we are. I think that's going to change soon, um, and you're already seeing you know, a lot of interest in um, 
maps from from in, in serious investments in maps from places that you may not have expected, like Uber, um, in terms of what they're doing right now, what they've just done, and what they may be about to do. Uh, it's very clear that they're prioritizing this in a really big way. And so I think, you know, people are going to be making that shift soon, um, and you're going to see a lot of what I think is just a natural fit and social actually start to come to fruition. So, but I think like Uber, I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff Uber is doing is not changing the consumer-facing stuff. It's all the back-end stuff. I mean, That's Uber true. is essentially trying to solve a supply-demand problem, and they're trying to anticipate what the demand is going to be for rides and where it's going to be. And so a lot of the stuff they're doing, users will directly see. Hopefully they'll see the effect of that. But, but I, I, I don't think they're spending a lot of time actually getting that little car moving towards your little blue dot. I think what they're really doing is figuring out how to get cars in that neighborhood at 8 o'clock on a Friday night or something like that. And, and that's a whole back-end analysis that I think um, you know the users will directly see, but where a lot of people are putting a lot of resources. So I'll, I'll, I'll pay you back on that because, uh, and I... I'd say that that's evidence of a general direction where we're moving away uh, from the map purely as a as a back, backdrop mechanism, especially satellite images. You know, that it makes maps look beautiful, but traditionally, when it's put into raster, that's eye candy and nothing more. And, and we're actually seeing now, um, as as our speakers have demonstrated, the idea of entity recognition, the idea of actually extracting sort of vector information from raster. Uh, raster imagery. Um, there's a, a, a startup in San Francisco called Lux Valet, uh, which basically sort of you tell them where you want your uh, them to pick up your car, and then they go off and park it while you go to the theater, and then you tell them when you want to pick it up. Um, the, the front end, you, you put a point on the map to say, yes, I'm going to drop drop it off here. But of course, the back end is all geospatial. You know, it's basically telling where the valets where they should be in the most likely position to get the highest uh, volumes of traffic and basically stand on this corner so you're ready because we get a lot of requests here. Uber does a lot of the same thing. And then of course, uh, the the app will tell the valet when you're going to be there because it's tracking you as you move. And so of course, that's you know traditional routing, but here the routing's not helping the consumer, it's actually helping the back end, which is supplying the service. So paradoxically, we're seeing a lot of the mapping move and the mapping intelligence move further, further down stack away from the consumer. And what's happening is the more seamless sort of service-based consumer layer moving up. Um, so while the eye candy moves away, the, the data uh, moves closer to us. So coming from me, if you go to Sevilla and you look at the, uh, the maps that the Spaniards used to come to, to the Americas, the, the maps, then and today haven't really changed much. They uh, they were printed on paper at the time, and now you know, if you compare Google Maps and uh, Air Maps, it sort of looked the same in some way, right? And we can argue that our streets are you know, more beautiful and the geo codes are better and all this kind of stuff. But in essence, the map visualization hasn't changed for something like 300 years, right? And uh, so we predict that. Uh, the way maps are rendered will be fundamental, will fundamentally change because today there's an overload of information and overwhelmingly that information is not used. You're navigating a city, what do you, what do you care about a river, right? You're, uh, you're walking downtown San Francisco, certain things are relevant for you, certain things are not. Maybe traffic's not relevant to you. So today the, the solution to uh, the user's problem is to dump everything and make it the user's problem and figure out what do you need. So we predict that uh, data uh, layering and uh, contextual layering is going to be very, very important going forward. Uh, reduction of information uh, its a big thing in theoretical physics. Uh, information is not data, data is not information. Uh, we predict that. Uh, the second thing is that geospatial data, uh, which is supply chain data, for example, velocity data, uh, swarm data, uh, usage data, consumption data applied to geospatial problems, uh, it's going to be a terrific, terrific market. If you think about the, the internet as a free communication vehicle or communication vehicle, we predict that uh, the next generation geospatial analytics platforms will solve real world problems. For example, ways that a wonderful job at getting me from A to B. And there will be an evolution of these kinds of services that, <clears throat> that use geospatial data that are rendered in very, very simple maps that are relevant to you as a consumer um, at the right time. 
And going back to, to our friends at Yelp, uh, the maps that you look at on Yelp are, are as beautiful as, as the maps on, on Google, as the maps on, on here. Uh, there's no differentiation. Um, and we predict that to be a fundamental game changer in the next few years. Okay. Question on, uh, so t Tom and I taught us something about um, crowdsourcing, you know, um, searches and creation, creation of big data, right? And um, is there, like, how, how can that, so there, there are certain instances where that is a great application where you need to, I, hey, I need five, half a million people to jump on this thing right away. Um, and are we going to see more of that in the future? It's specifically for points of interest. So, it's like, so, so six years ago, um, I was deploying Yahoo Maps in Latin America. So 18 markets. I think I had very sporadic nav tech data, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil. Horrible, right? No points of interest. So we had to team up with yellow page companies in each, each country and try to get the points of interest down. Um, the, uh, you know, had there been some crowdsourcing platform that could, we could have deployed and done this very quickly, um, that probably would have resolved, you know, we could probably done this a lot faster and probably more accurate. Um, you know, are, are there opportunities for app developers in the future to do this, right? To actually, to start to use the imagery, but then start leveraging large crowds to augment the, the data? So my answer to that would be absolutely yes. I mean, if you think about what Tom and I have done, I'm big fans and they've done some amazing things, um, particularly when you think about sort of the social impact that we've done with Tom and I. But if you look at other examples, like if you look at Waze, um, what you see there is, you know, you see more than 30 million users that are spending, I think it's about 400 hours a month on there. And they're, you know, either getting information or they're contributing it. I think that's something like 10 mapping journeys a month or so is the average. That's an enormous amount of time on site that is that seems like it's providing value to them. Um, so I think I think we've just started to scratch the surface. Um, but but what, I, what I think is really interesting when, when I think about that kind of model is that expectations have changed. And so people are expecting to have more information and be able to personalize it more um, and be able to you know, make it relevant to them specifically. And so whether we're talking about supply chain, you know, down if it's the back end or it's the front end, if you're looking to go on vacation and you're looking at a home away or one of those, I mean, it's not just the map, you're diving deep into the actual image. Um, so when you look at that, it, expectations have been raised a lot. And so to be able to keep up with that, I think leveraging the crowd is a really key place that a lot of people are going to want to have as an asset because um, you can't do it all on your own. So if you can do it with a group, um, you're more likely, I think, to get farther faster. On one hand, expectations are very, but on the other hand, there's sort of a fitness for use issue. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, on one hand, expectations are very, but there's a fitness for use. I mean, I was talking to, if you go back, say, 10 years ago, to the guys who were providing POIs, their big thing was was completeness, right? You had to have every stinking business at every stinking place around there. And, uh, and they'd have phone banks of people in, I don't know, Fargo, North Dakota, phoning, smiling and dialing and saying, you're still there and all that. Now, and for a lot of things, they don't really care about completeness. There's one guy who was doing sort of a social uh, media app so was saying this, you know, some guys in some accounting office on the second floor, and no, no one in my user base cares about them. I don't care to have them in my database. I want to have all the relevant people. And so that starts really narrowing the problem to a crowdsourceable problem. If my, cons if my users want it and it's not there, they can add it. And that's the way, I believe, the way Foursquare built their database. And so you're getting things like that that might have been seeded by a, uh, a commercial database, but then are eventually crowdsourced. I think there's a whole bunch of uh, other apps. You know, the other thing on crowdsourcing is you've got active crowdsourcing. I, as a crowd, am actively giving you some information. There's also passive crowdsourcing. Waze and a lot of the guys on traffic are doing sort of passive crowdsourcing, right? We're just, um, I think Twitter is a huge source of passive crowdsourcing information data, um, which I don't think has been exploited very well at all. And, and there's some companies just starting to do that. Yeah, because I think um, I've seen, um, Emergency services, emergency responders. So when we have the big one, uh, they're they're red. They're they have tools to look at social media to find out what where things happening. And because what happens? Tokenization will go down. 
but somehow the internet still survives. And it was funny, you had to see Haiti and things like that. Large amounts of information were being tweeted, posted on Facebook, and um, emergency, you know, the, the teams were trying to crowdsource the data to understand what was going on and where to, where to serve, uh, send, uh, send, uh, send services, just like how some of the visual data could be used uh, to do the same thing. And open street map, right? I think yeah. that's something that we probably need to mention. If we're talking about geospatial, we're talking yeah. about crowdsourcing. That's the typical thing there. And in fact, open street map has a team that is devoted so yeah. that if there's an emergency, they just activate, right? So yeah. hot team. Um, yeah. I think we're going to learn a lot about human beings uh, and how they interact with uh, specific crowdsourcing tasks. So touching upon Mark's point about sort of uh, primary, secondary, or voluntary crowdsourcing. So ways you're you're contributing back to a data pool. You don't have ownership of that data pool, which you know, and many of us would find problematic. But ways that it very successfully. Uh, but here's this is how you contribute. You drive from one point to another, dead easy, right? So it's a secondary mechanism. You are by driving by using the app. Your your so-called data exhaust is creating something different. If they, you know, if they had some kind of crowdsourced thing where you could generate data by eating dessert, we'd all be generating data quite frequently just because it's so easy. Um, the actual process of going in and say digitizing around a building, a lot of folks, uh, you know, this is how OSM got created is because there's something that's deep within the human psyche that 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 gives us uh, that that gives us pleasure when we create order from chaos and we actually look over the satellite imagery and we create the roads and the buildings. One thing that isn't uh, is actually adding POI in places data. So um, it's uh, you can't pay, pay people enough just to input address data because it's probably one of the most boring things ever on the planet. And it's why OpenStreetMap doesn't have, it's one of, the, one of several reasons that they don't really have a huge coverage of POI. It's just not as fun, it's not engaging. It doesn't tickle the lower brainstem in the way that actually creating vectors do. Um, and what we found, I mean, if you think about Foursquare, checking in uh, created that sort of X and Y coordinate. The user would probably add a business name. But, you know, Foursquare isn't great with uh, uh, address data and phone numbers because you have to go outside, look in the building and say, oh, that's the address, and then find a business card and say, oh, that's the phone number. And that's just a bridge too far. Um, and so as we look at these kinds of businesses that are built on data, as you look at the actual more direct businesses that say, look, if you get this data, we will pay you, I think what we're finding is that, that there is a, a the, the blurred lines are beginning to sharpen between the kind of things that human enjo humans enjoy doing spatially that generates data and helps us focus the map, and then the things over here which are much more onerous and painful, painful and you have to throw cash at us to actually get down and, and start creating data. But a lot of that, I mean, you know, I was thinking, and, and to go with the imagery thing, I mean, one of the things that, that um, with imagery is, is, is Shai was saying, I mean, there's just, there's so much imagery just coming at you. And, 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 and so the question is not really, here's another picture of the Sahara Desert. It's like, what's, what's changed? And so I think Tom Nod did something which says, hey, we can figure out how to figure out what's changed by focusing bazillions of people on it. And there are certain cases where we can do that. But the other part of that is, you know, a lot of people are working on, on uh, you know, change detection imagery, and then from that, now we say, hey, there's been a change. Now maybe we can go look at those specific places on Earth where there's change, and that becomes really interesting. I was talking to, um, I was talking to a guy at Airbnb. So Airbnb would love to know what areas are gentrifying fastest, right? I mean, if you think about it, where do you go say in Airbnb? It's like in the Mission. It's you know wherever. So they would like to know that. So how can you do that? Well, there's probably construction. There's probably sales of premium gasoline for European imported cars. There's probably you know you counting baby strollers and, and, and people in small hats and you know there's a very variety of things that you can do to to judge gentrification if you could somehow go count that or, or get change detection and then go look more closely at it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the number of Audis and BMWs in the neighborhood. Right? <laughs> but, I, mean, I mean, seriously, if you, had, if you had, and there are services that show who's selling what type of gas, if you looked at where increase of premium gas, I mean, who uses premium gas anymore? It's only Audis and BMWs and stuff, right? Interesting. Is that right, Tyler? I think that's right. <laughs> Tyler would know that. <laughs> so, um, so uh, let's move on. Let's, let's talk about some some 
current trends in industry. What's going on in our in our in our business? Um, uh, you know, markets. So, a couple of questions like, there's, a, you know, why is there a new interest um, on the part of major internet and mobile platforms to own their own geo assets? So, we've seen Uber. Uber wanted to buy Spree recently. Um, they bought a former one of your former companies, and, yeah. and which is which is good for you, right? Finally, those those shares. Have, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Drinks on me. Um, yeah, no, I, I think yeah. that was an interesting. Um, well, here's why I thought it was interesting, besides the fact that I had some shares. Um, I thought it was interesting because I don't think Uber was on a lot of people's um, radar as someone who's going to develop geospatial assets. And, and all of a sudden they came in. It turns out they'd actually been in New York talking to companies about acquisition. So they're in a very active acquisition. But, but I don't think that Uber, you know, people were thinking, well, yeah, Google's building a map. Um, you know, Apple certainly, you know, out there doing stuff. Microsoft maybe, you know, maybe Facebook will get into it. But people weren't thinking Uber, and then Uber came along and bought something. It was a fairly, you know, deep technology. I think, and we were talking about this before, I think five years ago I thought no, there was going to be one mapping company in the world. Um, and now I think there are actually going to be dozens. I, and I think the reason is because companies want to own that geospatial data that's super important to them. And, and Uber had specific data needs that they weren't going to get if they were going to use Apple or Google or any or, or even here. And so they decided we're going to own that piece of it. And I see that happening, frankly, across the industry. I and mean, I, I can think of dozens where, where that investment's happening. So a question, did they buy a map or a platform? Uh, I think they bought some very specific technologies. But they didn't they, I mean, they did buy map data with, with the Carter. They certainly didn't buy map data. And they were rumored to be buying another large uh, European map data company. And, and there's been a lot of speculation on whether that makes sense for them. And, um, um, yeah, go. So what's going on with here? <laughs> it's, uh, are the rumors true? <laughs> well, I think here actually. Well, here. Yeah. Actually, you talk. Tell, tell us. <laughs> No comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so what Nokia did say, I mean, Nokia did make a comment that said, we're exploring strategic options, right? Which means they're, they're out looking at something. And I, I would argue that's been a fairly given course for a while. So a comment for me, the, I, it seems that there are two, in the mapping business, there are two elements. One is the, the map building, or the building of the, the vector data, or the actual map content. That's not trivial. Because whether you're OSM or whether you're Google or whether you're here, etc., etc., et, cetera, et cetera, you know, tracing a road is a laborious exercise, whether you do it by drone, satellite, person, or other means, right? So the map data business is a, is a complicated one and, and heavy duty. And then there's the map, mapping platform business, which is a different one. It's a software business, right? And so I think over time, what we'll see is where many platforms will evolve that will access certain data sets that will render you know, maps in a beautiful way for your particular use case. You're running a, uh, a navigation system for bicycles. You know, do, do you want to build your own map data? Unlikely. Um, do you want to create a specific application that allows your cyclist to get from A to B faster, better, cleaner? That's a, that's a different problem, right? So that's my prediction, that the map data business will be kept in, in a few hands and the platform business will explode. And, and those few hands, um, is, it, is it open data? Is it private data? What is, um, because there, there are, there are I guess there's, there's two views of the system, right? We have a, uh, an open source solution and then we have this private stuff. And um, which, I guess, which one, Obviously, you know, is one better than the other, and is there is there is there and is you know and then what's the value of having one that's open versus one that's actually or one that's basically um, it's it's it, it, there's it's like Wikipedia where its contributors are open to the public versus something that's closed like an Apple environment. I think you're coming back to the earlier point that that Mark made about how map data is such a valuable resource that everybody wants to to own it. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, it, it's always in that tough kind of position. I mean, guys like Mapbox and, and Mapsen and others, you know, they're developing core geotechnologies, which are hugely, hugely val valuable. 
and I've not been in any, any of the BD meetings, but I can imagine they go in and say, oh, we really, really like this, and then they go back, and, you know, the, the potential customer, and they say, God, we should really develop that ourselves. And all of us in this room have probably worked with organizations that say, oh, yeah, we, we could probably do that. And then they go off and spend a gazillion dollars trying to make their own geocoder, and they all end up in padded cells. So the interesting thing about, yep, that's, yeah, if you, okay, yeah, that's sort of what you get when you work on a geocoder. It's a padded, padded room um, with sleeves that go all the way around. Uh, but but, that's, but that's, that, that's basically sort of the longer way of saying that map d data, and I think the technology stack that sits on top that Descartes represented are both two mechanisms that sit on this curious sort of razor's edge where you know it's a it's an invaluable technology that people want to buy, but it's so invaluable that they also want to build it. And the the, the companies like those that I mentioned are you know they navigate that narrow strait very very well, um, and it touches upon the data because very often you can't do what you want with commercial data. You can't do what you want with OpenStreetMap data, and that means you have to source your own. As an example. So question, do, do you think over time that people will build proprietary later data layers on a, on a standard set? Uh, so if you take a look at Uber um, as, an ex uh, as an example to help answer your question, I think, uh, and to touch on Mark's concern, which is uh, while the here's of the world and Google's and TomToms and others have gone to create global data sets and open street map global data sets, what we're seeing is this sort of uh, um, like heartbeat is the heart is now constricting, and companies like Uber are probably saying to themselves, and I have no inside knowledge, but they're probably saying to themselves, we only need high resolution street and turn restriction data for the cities in which Uber operates, and then when we move out to a new city, you know, we'll figure that out. We'll get some seed data, or we'll just get our drivers running over it, and they're probably developing their own data sets. But I think you're seeing is is now that the and uh, this is a totally sort of facile, broad picture I'm painting, but now that the global map data box has been ticked, there's going to be specific use cases that grow up, and we're going to see sort of uh, niches of, of homegrown and home-baked geodata evolve over time. But, but that's, I mean, that it's, but only those that can afford to do that will be able to do that, though. And then now we have two guys in the garage that need access to data. And I, I'm leading to this, like, I want to have a, a discussion about open versus the closed proprietary stuff. And Ronnie, maybe you or even Mark, you guys chime in. It's like, is, is, is it really a battle out there? Is it really uh, open street maps versus, uh, you know, some other, some other proprietary uh, data set? It, can you really compare them? Or, or, or is it like, you know, or like if you look at Mapbox and now they're trying to do their own proprietary solution, is it? But there's probably other ones that are all out there and they're available. What you know? What uh, what are you guys' thoughts on that? So so what I would say though is I would step back a little bit there, and I, I guess when we're talking a lot about map data, uh, it seems like a lot of the context is you know around street data, right? But you know I can go grab an Excel sheet of all my customers, you know, put it online, geocode it against any of the geocoders there and relate that to census data. Is that geospatial data? Yes, that's geospatial okay. data. That is useful. It has nothing to do with uh, street data, except for the geocoder, I guess, that is somebody. Okay. But, um, you know, everybody, pretty much, if you're an app developer, your phone has a location, you're collecting geospatial data, right? Like, there's, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be street. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Proprietary I think, I mean, or open. I mean, to, to play the old, old history guy uh, card, I mean, this market 10 years ago, the only place anyone was making money was in navigation. And so the, this industry has always been cursed by the, the driving thing, right? It's a, that's like the first thing we always think of. Now there's a whole bunch of applications where driving is not the primary thing. Maybe streets aren't even the primary things. And that's a whole different set of data and a whole different use case. I mean, here data is, is exquisite data on things like turn restrictions and you know stuff like that. They spend a lot of money and as, as uh, the driving requirements have gone higher to kind of lane-based guidance, those requirements have gone even higher. But there's another piece of, of business underneath, which is around visualization. We want to see where stuff is. And, and there's public data sources, there's open, open source data. So I think there's going to be 
you know, people are going to say, what's my use case, and then pick their data to go, go fit that. Um, the other thing I would say, and you know, just having, having worked with, with a lot of data on the business side, is people want to be able to do with the data what they want to do. And I think one of the reasons, you know, I got asked by a banker, why did Google go build their own data? Was it to save money? I said, no, that would just be the stupidest thing they could have done. They spent way more money building their map data than they ever were going to pay TomTom. -tom. Um, but they did it because they wanted to do with the data what they wanted to do with it. And they wanted to innovate, and, and, and they were able to successfully do that. The reason their maps are so good is because they were able to innovate at their own pace. And I think that's going to be the other thing from a strictly business terms is, is can you do with it what you want to do with it. Yeah, so just to add to that, I think um, when you look at OpenStreetMap in particular, I think that a lot of people really want to work with OpenStreetMap. They like the concept of open and everything, but when they actually get there, what you find is a lot of people, they find gaps, and they realize that you know they need they need more than that, and that their, their users in particular are an incredibly rich source of mapping that they are not necessarily tapping into and are not going to be necessarily open source mapping today. So I think kind of going back to your question in terms of trends, you know, there's kind of two things. One is the moves that Uber make is move, making is kind of making mapping cool. Um, you know, prior to that, it was kind of people who were uh, sorry, who were twenty years of my life right. wasted. <laughs> <laughs> now you're cool, say, Mark. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, prior to that, you had you know a lot of sort of uh, PhD you know mapping enthusiasts doing really interesting you know searches around the world, um, and uh, you know they're cool. But you know the ones that work in digital globe are particularly cool. But uh, but you know I mean think, I'm texting my kids yeah, so I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. No, but I mean I think seriously when you look at the average person who does not have that background, there, there's really two things happening. Is companies are realizing that if they don't capture that data, they're giving it to someone else. So just the information around what that user is doing, the contextual information is priceless, which is one of the reasons why Google spent something crazy like over a billion dollars building their maps. But I think the other thing is, I think people are starting to see um, mapping and imagery as a way to delight customers um, in a way that was kind of obscure before. So I don't know how people feel about this. When I pull up my Uber app, you know, I love seeing the little dots of different cars and SUVs or whatever it is that I'm looking for around my house. And I compare that to what that used to be like. If, you, if those, of, those of you who lived in San Francisco, don't even try the peninsula, you know, looking for a taxi, it was just like, you know, winning the lottery or something, if something came by. And now I can turn on Uber, and I can see stuff all around me moving around, and I'm like, that's awesome. Like, it makes me happy. You know, it's the same thing when I, I log in Homeway or, you know, VRBO, and I can look at all the things. You know, this is my vacation, this is what I want to do, but oh my goodness, there's all the other things around there that I could do too. Um, and I'm actually someone who actually goes on vacation. Um, you know, occasionally I try to do it on a regular basis, but even if I don't go, I like going and exploring. You know, and so making that part of the, the user experience that delights you, makes you want to come back, that's something new, and that's cool, and your average person um, who isn't a PhD um, looking for people who've been lost for thousands of years, <laughs> uh, you know, are gonna understand that. Yeah, and what are gonna be my, like, so, so how many folks, app developers here, interested in and adding some of the data. So, what are what are some of the what are what are the platforms that are available to two guys in a garage? I can't I can't write a big check. I can't I don't I don't have any money to write to pay anybody. So, there are platforms out there, right? Providers, Google, etc. That doesn't cost me anything up to a certain level. But what else is out there available to me, right? Because it would, it's like if you can write a big check, there's tons of providers available. If you have nothing to start off with, there's not that many. And I don't know maybe if you guys have. Oh, right, you should have at least an idea. You're you have no cash. You're yeah, 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 you have no cash. Well, then, there's some ego cloud two, in there too. You're, 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 two platform. people in a garage. You're doing and you're trying to do a startup. You use it, uh, mapping data, imagery, etc. Maybe you're after, after chasing points of interest as well. Yeah, I would turn it around and I would say, what is it that you're trying to do, right? Because it's such a broad question. It's kind of like saying, like, what can you do with computers? A lot of stuff. Um, if you're trying to, you know, if you're looking for base imagery, it's very different than if you're trying to do some analysis with street data, than if you're trying to do routing, than if you're trying to visualize maps, if you're trying to grab Twitter data, you're trying to like drive geospatial information or some like insight from your customers. 
And so there's plenty of like, you know, platforms out there that specialize in all these different things. They're all related to geospatial data. Um, but, you know, particularly like if I was going to try to look, I don't know, some social media dashboard uh, and look at the location of these things, I wouldn't go to Google particularly because that's not what they do best. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's quite a few options there. That's how I would think about it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I was uh, I was talking to a banker. Um, maybe bankers in the room. Bankers are not terribly imaginative people. Uh, so what they usually do is they wait until. Uh, sorry. Um, they, they kind of wait until something sells and then they say, "What else is out there like that?" And uh, when Uber bought the card, a banker bankers always want to buy me coffee after things like that. And I say, what else is there? And the guy was saying, "I don't think there's anything else out there." And I, I looked at him. I thought, "Wow." You know, and, and actually, so my analysis is, I think there was like, the, the tipping point was like where you started before Google Maps or after Google Maps. If you were started before Google Maps, yeah, that the table's pretty much been cleared. Those guys all lived through a hellish disruption, and the table's been fairly well cleared. But if you look recently, there are many different types of platforms, and a lot of those have either interesting data, interesting services. They all have APIs. I think Tyler even has an API. It is a factual. They have a bunch of great data out there. And it's not just the, the data about places, it's the data about what those places mean. So you're starting to get you know, better data. Um, you know, I'll, I'll put a plug in for Mapbox. Mapbox does a far better job of developing APIs for, for developers than, than anyone was doing five years ago. Um, Another company I think that, that um, Shai showed is CardoDB. CardoDB is aiming not so much at developers who want to write uh, um, uh, applications with JavaScript APIs, but it's aiming for guys who are on sort of the technical level, I know how to use Excel. And I'd like to do something with maps, and I, that's about my skill level. So I took my Christmas card list and plotted it on a very nice map. I'd be happy to show it to you if you'd be interested. But it's not very hard to do. And so they're aiming at like journalists and people like that. So I think there are a whole bunch of different um, opportunities out there. You know, whether you want data, whether you want platforms, or what your skill level is. Cool. And it, it's less about that, that just because uh, I think this is very important, Mark, so that's why I'm going to just so. sort of piggyback on top, uh, is that it's uh, there's two things that you're seeing out. You know, the data is more available than it ever has been, uh, but also the, uh, the the cost of doing sales is so much easier. Um, you know, working with geodata used to be so expensive and problematic, and I'm looking at you here, Digital Globe, you're much better now. <laughs> um, but also just just the, the integration layers, you know, just how, to, how you actually get this in and get it going on the front end, hugely, hugely problematic. And a lot of these companies, especially with the, the, you know, the younger and newer companies, are building as part of their business model that we are easy to do business with. And that's now a differentiator in, in, in the geospatial market. And it's actually working. Well, think about it. I mean, the, that was a great picture of all those hard drives. I mean, but that's literally the truth. If you wanted to get all this wonderful data, they shipped you hard drives. Now, it's, you know, here's the API and you go do it. And, and, and you can get that and you can get very good archives and things like that. And so, I mean, but that's across the board in this business. So I'm gonna take a little break. Goats has got to take off to the airport. So I wanna say thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marvin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, can we talk about who's going to buy here now? Yeah, we, 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 we can talk about that. Right, so, um, I, uh, let's, uh, let's cover a couple, uh, just do three more questions. Are you guys, are you guys feeling, okay, who's tired? Raise your hand. You keep, want to keep on going? Raise your hand. Are there cocktails in the lounge? Right, yeah, there's more, there's more stuff in the lounge. All right, so, uh, um, what does IoT mean for maps and the geospatial, and, and geospatial space? So IoT. So now we have a new shiny object in the valley. Everyone's doing hardware and Kickstarters and, and stuff like that and Indiegogo projects. And um, what's going to be the place of or of the, these pieces of hardware? Because we've been carrying phones with us all day long for the last decade, and that's been contributing to data. Now we have cars, we have watches, we have other things. How is that? How is that going to change? Or affect this business. Well, it's pretty open. It's a broad, broad question, but I'm just curious to see what well, you guys, what your thoughts are. I mean, there are a whole bunch of ways, but I mean, one thing is um, the the data streams 
you know, geodata used to be fairly static. I mean, you know, businesses were like the most dynamic thing. They went out of business once every 27 years or something like that. Now you're just going to have huge data flows all with location tagging on it. And, um, and, and being able to take that and process it. And, you know, most database systems, I know, so I'm told, most database systems aren't really good at streaming data. And so you have things like Storm and Spark and things like that that are really starting to come in. Um, uh, and I think people are starting to look at how do we look at these massive flows of real-time data with location tag and then extract events out of that and then make conclusions <laughs> out of that. So if I know the ambient level of tweetage, say, on Union Square, and all of a sudden I see that on a Wednesday afternoon the tweetage goes up, then, you know, who knows? What, what could it be? Well, it's April 20th at 420 or something. Maybe something's going on. Um, but, but, you know, that's the gate the, park. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, those... Dealing with those data flows is, I think, one of the big opportunities for people right now. I think we're at the beginning of that. Uh, you said what I was thinking. <laughs> but uh, what I would add to that is that what's interesting is that, um, you know, you have all these objects. These objects have location, right? And they're, sometimes they're moving, sometimes they're not. When they're moving, they're interesting to me because that's when technologies like Spark and all these things that are coming out are, become interesting. I, I'll give you an example. Um, so we, uh, you know, all the real-time data for all the light rail and all the buses from VTA, from the Valley Transportation Authority, it goes through Amigo Cloud, right? And so at the beginning, we, were store, we were storing it in a traditional GIS databases, which was fine for a few, you know, million records or whatever, right? Once you started getting into the realm where it's like, well, they're sending us like, you know, 10 million records, 15 million records every day. Um, it starts changing, right? Um, what they wanted to do was to be able to show. So, so at that point, you, you start getting to be able to show some insight that they weren't able to do before. Like we can put out on the dashboard and tell them, like, hey, by the way, this is the list of like the top ten best drivers that you have in the past five minutes. And by the way, these other guys here have been speeding next to school zone in the past five minutes, you may actually want to talk to them. Or So you start getting like stream of data that is very, very accurate, that doesn't need to be processed in a you know, big like, you know, Hadoop <coughs> cluster like a month later or whatever, but you can start to be able to do it in real time. That's, that's really interesting. Um, so uh, Google, I think, last year did an acquisition of the microsatellites. And we've seen that that project, right? There was like three million bucks. I could go make one, or the thirty k. Forget how much. How much? Oh uh, no! How much you can? How much it would cost to make one of these little tiny things? But. Um, oh wow! Okay. And then how much does it cost to actually make one to get one made built? Still money in the bank when they bought it, so we can do the space. Oh wow! Okay. Cool. But I know that. Um, so so my question is like, how are these microsatellites going to change the industry? Um, and kind of what makes them different from traditional satellites. So I, I think this is all hugely exciting because uh, my, my short answer is that uh, the nice thing is when you have uh, two um, data sets that say the same thing. So let's uh, imagine uh, two images of the same surface area on the ground taken two weeks apart. Uh, you don't have actually two bits of information, you've got three. And the third one, of course, is the delta between the two. Uh, and so the, the, the principle that I'm potentially excited about, of course, is, is actually we're, we're now beginning to see uh, more uh, interesting changes over time, which lead to deeper insights to how things are moving, uh, how things are changing on the, on the, on the ground. Okay. Yeah, because there's a, there's a company, Localizer, who's out, out here, and they do like footfall, right? You can, so a neighborhood every hour changes demographic, by the way. So people are like, I am doing location-based targeting for advertising. Well, actually, what time of the day was the um, sample done or the actual census, right? Um, because that, that, that square block actually changes every every minute, right? It's continuous, right? Um, so it, maybe that could add, you know, if you get more dynamic information or if it's updated and, um, a little bit more often and get fresh data. Yeah, and even when you're talking about just microsatellites, right? Like everybody's approach was completely different. You know, I know the the Skybots people were showing like real time video from space, 
right? Where you can start like actually doing, you know, computer vision. Well, like the stuff stalking an ex-girlfriend, right? <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> right. So versus you know something like Planet Labs, where they were aiming for like much much cheaper uh, microsatellites that you know weren't able to do like real time video, but they were so much cheaper to make that they would just show like throw twenty of them um, and be able to get a you know bigger constellation of having uh, more photos. Uh, more often of lower quality, right? And it's so, not as easy as hooking up a GoPro. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, that's another spot on the spectrum, right? I mean, I mean, I think what you're seeing is you're seeing just a a, a growing, uh, you know, range of different options to capture different imagery, and and I think at one end of the spectrum, yeah, it's it's uh, you know, flying your GoPro up around there and, and doing things like that. You've got you've got a bunch of different options. On the aerial imagery, you've got the you know, microsats at various things, and you've got the big stats that are getting very high resolution and, and worldwide coverage. And so I think there's going to be a continuum. And as Tyler said, you know, you increase that the, the temporal resolution, you just get much more data um, around. It does put more pressure on, on change detection um, because it says you're getting more and more data. You've got to be able to figure out what's changing because that's what's going to be interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to add. I think that having more sources of information, imagery, in all different ways is, is extremely exciting. But I think what the big question for me is what happens next? So you have the imagery, now what do I do with it? I have, you know, if you look at the kind of the big biggest player out here, Google, I mean, they spend the majority of their, of their investment really taking pictures, there's aerial or all different satellite and other places and actually trying to make it into, you know, a unified picture for the user that, that makes you know, a sense. It's contextually clear. And that's a lot easier said than done. Mm -hmm. So I think when you think about what microsatellites can do, I think it's it's actually the technology that might be able to apply to it after they collect the image that I think could be really, really interesting. Um, they they want to be able to, to take, you know, great pictures at less cost. But in doing so, there's some things that you're going to sacrifice. So what other technologies could you possibly bring in that would help maybe make balance that out? So I think it's that secondary step, which is really interesting to me. You mentioned the 800 pound gorilla, you know, and that's Google, right? And so, um, and they are apparently they are a leader in some of the, in some of the areas for data sets. And is anyone can ever going to catch Google, or 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 do you have to really, or is it really is there really a race to catch at Google uh, at the end of the day? No, I think. I mean, that's that's perception for people that are outside the industry. They think, oh, I was, I oh, you don't be like Google with maps. It's like, well, do you have to be like that to really, to really win and where where you're focused on? Dude, you've probably heard the story where the the, the VC, the you know, venture capital, asks asks a startup and they say, okay, you know, well, what are you going to do when Google gets into your business? And then, of course, with the advent of Google Ventures, you can say, well, you know, what did you do when Google got into yours? And it's it's <laughs> and so, so it's you know and, and the answer of course is that it doesn't wipe everything out you know every every company has its its own specific focus its own specific flavor um, you know it, any any company cannot be everything to all people it can certainly try um, but there's a lot of fantastic companies many of them are represented in this audience that do just a few things extremely well. Uh, and you know that is the way to focus and grow a company and win. I, I think you know. Um, so when I was uh, gosh, ten years ago, when I was showing people uh, how the describing the industry, I'll do this from your 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 left to right. Um, I always said you know there's data and there's platforms here and then there are apps here and then there are devices and out here's the user and the whole assumption was um, data and information flew flow this way, and the user out here took his wall, his or her wallet out of his or her pocket of her, I'm sorry, Jenny was politically correct, took money and floated back that way, and we all picked off our money, and, and that was sort of the assumption, and everyone built their business around that, that, that value chain, and what Google figured out before any of the rest of us did was um, actually the information being created by this person was the most important thing, so we can afford to build this whole value chain and give it away to this guy for free because the data we're going to collect from that end user was really the valuable thing. And I think that was that piece of knowledge, which a bunch of us were too stupid to understand for a long time, was what wiped out a huge chunk of the industry. But 
Having said that, I think in the last three years, people have figured that out. And the reason you see people um, starting to invest in this is because they want that data that that guy's, that guy's generating. And they want it for themselves. And, and so I think people are going to figure out what that is. I mean, Uber is never going to build a Google Maps-like platform. I don't think that's their goal. But they do want that data, and they're going to build the assets to get it. It really depends what, right, what you're trying to do. I mean, every time somebody asks me that, then uh, I'm surprised nobody has mentioned ESRI, right? Like ESRI, the big GIS like monster in this um, you know, space. And, and basically, what ends up happening is that um, when somebody says, well, is it, if Google gets in there, aren't they trying to get your business? I'm like, oh, we're, we're an enterprise company, for example, right? There's Google Maps engine where, you know, it used to be there, they were trying to do something on the enterprise space, and then they decided they didn't want to because it's really not their business. Uh, so, you know, I think questions when whenever is that, oh, because it has a map, it has to be compared to, you know, Google Maps or Bing or whatever, then are really silly questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to, to open up to the audience um, for a couple of questions. If you guys have questions, raise your hand. Mark Michael has the mic. Anybody with questions? Okay, over here. Question, please. Yes, uh, so this is the question that I haven't heard anybody address. Now, we've talked about what the user generates as data. In our post NSA Snowden world, what about privacy? Good question. Can you repeat the question? What about what about privacy? Was that the question? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do when the user decides that? So, what are you going to do when the user decides that we're going to turn off the location on your smartphone? Okay, so I don't work for a company, so I don't have to make anyone particularly happy. When have you seen users do that anywhere in the internet yet? In your rare and wonderful example. I, I mean, the reality is, I mean, the reality, so, look, there's got to be some real, there's got to be some real protections around that. I think people are building protections in, um, you know, the other day I was using um, Strava, you know, running thing. Strava has a feature which says if you want to turn off your origin and, uh, end point of your run. You can't, because guess what? That shows you where I live, usually. Um, and so people are starting to do that. I think people will be smarter about it. Um, most data today, most companies I see that are collecting location data seriously do not want personal identifying information. There are severe penalties if you get that and want to store it. And most are taking, um, you know, taking it and abstracting it. Having said that, um, you know, the internet is about a trade-off between useful information about your interests, intent, and, and preferences in exchange for some wonderfully valuable services, and, and that's, that's a trade-off that we're all making every day. So, Mark, I, I, I mean, well, two things. First of all, I think it's a false pairing to say that giving your company, your, your voluntarily giving your location data or any data to a big behemoth company or even a small one is the same or equal or should be held in the same breath as you know, basically the government taking it without permission. Not least because it's being acquired under two extremely different terms, but also the companies can't kill you legally and the government can. <laughs> so if you want to paint it in the most black and white terms, you know, that that is what I would say is that the first I'm reminder move that, a little away from Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> that's like he's gonna strike. I know spot the guy with the EFF hat. Uh, now the the, the the other red thing dot on your forehead. <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 other very important aspect is that companies that engage in this kind of thing are exchanging in a and the idea is it has to be an explicit exchange of value with the consumer. The consumer gives the company data and the company gives them a service and uh, both through law and through good practice and general sort of naming and shaming this is increasingly getting to be a very sensitive, so sensitive that it's baked, certainly baked into every contract that Factual does. Um, but if you look at like what happened with, in the end, unfairly to, was it Snapchat, I think, that got called out for having uh, you know, user location data. Tons of people were fired. It was in the news across the, 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 the Western world. It, it ends up that the reporter got it wrong and they were just using IP address and storing it in the logs. But, 
uh, it, it was a, a, an incredible exemplar of the sensitivity that people, consumers and companies, and uh, uh, sort of governing bodies have around this issue. So the, the short answer to your, to your question, I think, is that there is a, a hugely important and evolving discussion around consumer privacy and location that's happening now. Increasingly, that uh, the, the, the knobs are, are being put into the control of the consumer. And that's the way it absolutely has to be. Uh, and and, and that, that, of course, is a very different uh, conversation um, philosophically from the government side. But, you know, I think the knobs are there. The question is, do people use them? And that, I guess, do we care? I, I mean, you know, do, like, do, 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 when, do, do, when, you care, right? when you do a horoscope application and it asks, can I use your location? I don't know, do horoscopes depend on my location? I, I don't know, why do they people want People always say, okay, who has Android and you install the app and says, they want access to you? Email, phone number, you just say, yeah, 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 just give me the app, right? <laughs> we all do that. And none of us, who's going to say no, right? And it's, and it's either you have to take the whole thing or you don't. Or you think, yeah, right? I think actually most companies are giving a lot. I mean, some are, are not doing a good job, but most are giving pretty good control over it. It's just a question of if people are paying attention. I mean, you know, I would well, she pays attention, right? I would, well, I expect this room probably yeah. pays more attention than... than well, you know. no, I mean, well, I had an interesting experience with... Um, uh, lady friends who check in when they, they, they check in they, they check in on force guard when they leave and I was like why why you why yeah why do women do that well, okay that's her yeah why, because women have a really different relationship to being data exhibitionists than yeah. men yeah you, and I, it, you, the three of you have very different concerns than the few women who are here in this room and you probably haven't talked to that many women except maybe your wives about, about, about what women really care about do you know what women really care about around privacy and personal data apparently not <laughs> I, the thing is, is that I'm a usability researcher and I, I study privacy and, and when I test people Basically, women and non-defaults care a lot more about this than the defaults. And so you just get very different answers. We want different controls. We want different features. We use it differently. And I check in when I leave. Yeah, I, I, All the women so I know was, check in women, when we leave. Do you think women will pay more attention to that than men? I, I'm just curious. I mean, what, like they will look and when it says, will you turn on location, women will mm -hmm. picture that. Yeah, it was my experience like four years ago. And I was like, what, what, what were you doing? I, I, I need to check in. I need to check in this cool place. I'm like, why? He goes, well, I don't want certain people in on here. That was interesting. Uh, or the, well, I, guess, I guess people, guys tend to show up when you don't want them, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what kind of happens. And I didn't quite understand that until, until then. So we should also, this, con this part of the conversation, which I think is hugely important, we should embrace not just sort of check-ins, which I think is a very facile, very important, but also just a part of the of the conversation. But it's also your your tie between your device and you as an individual. So that's a critical part of privacy. And you're seeing now th these are the steps that both the operating systems and uh, and manufacturers are taking. Where it used to be just a couple of years ago with earlier versions of iOS and Android is that you. There was no ability to sever the identifier of the device from you, the owner. Uh, so what I meant by that is that when you get the when you get the phone, the phone ID is being broadcast and consumed by advertisers and other people. And there's nothing that you, as a consumer, can do about it. And now there's both explicit and implicit ways that you can sever that. One is that they have a new kind of uh, identifier. It's no longer just the the device ID. Two, it can change. So now, for example, when your Bluetooth handset probes and, it, and it's looking for Bluetooth connections, it changes its address over time. So there's not a persistent address. And then three, there's actual controls that you can go in and say, change my advertising ID. And that effectively resets your online presence, uh, at least anything that uses that ID as an identifier. But that's so deep, and I, I guess that's the question, is do people really so, do that? So I mean, even yeah. if they would like to do it, do they know to do that? So this, this is my point, though, Mark, is that um, no, very few people outside of this room, and even some of us inside the room, take the time to go in and, and start flipping these things off and on. It, it's good that it's there. 
But what's most important, and, and the reason I use that Bluetooth example, is that these mechanisms are being built in to automatically protect consumers' privacy, and a lot of that is being driven by the uh, operating system manufacturers. So you don't have to worry about it. So the yeah. thing that, just to share the answer to your question, like what do people do, um, in the research that I do, what people do is they uninstall apps that make them nervous. So they don't necessarily go and figure out how the, all the controls work. Some people do, and it's actually a fairly decent percentage, but most people just say, I this, nerve, this app makes me nervous, I'm just gonna take it out. And they get a different app, or they just don't use that service. Yeah, so just to add to this, and I, I would agree that I think that there's more today and the more questions in terms of, hey, you're making a decision at this moment when you download this app, here are some options. But I don't think the extent to which the agreement is made in terms of leveraging my information is really understood at all um, by most of us using a phone. Even when we think we do, there's so much going on behind the scenes that you, unless you literally are like a mobile cell phone builder expert, they're, you're only going to know the tip of the iceberg. Um, and it's kind of funny to me what you're saying because I, I don't know if any of you guys have seen this, but there recently has been a, uh, a launch of uh, the new TV show CSI Cyber, and I've gotten a little obsessed about it in the last month, and I'm wondering if that may have something to do with my national interest in privacy, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I think the fact is, is like that there's just so much going on. Um, that we that we don't know about, and all of us just sitting in this room right now with our phones and our tablets, and we're we're making implicit agreements with people in terms of having access to our our little you know wireless world around us. Um, so, you know, I do think there are more options. I think that there's still our world is complicated, and there's still a lot of work to do here. I think. Yeah, and, my, and, and we call ourselves the experts too on this. I know. Um, I think we got one more question, and then we'll wrap up. A question to the audience to think about is when you think of Facebook and it being social and it's primarily driven by women and who in society is considered the most social creatures the women when I look at app development communities and when I go into app houses and when I go visit VCs I see very few clicks of app developers saying you know what we better bring in a woman because by God, we're building a social app and we think we know everything, I would encourage everybody to enlist a woman early on to do your field testing, to be there. If you actually hired them or put them part of the founders, you wouldn't have to uh, go pay for all that research as much. <laughs> awesome. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot of information uh, or a lot of interest on big data and privacy would be an interesting thing in the future to have. Um, look guys, um, we're going to wrap it up because we got 20 minutes of just socializing left. Uh, I have one last question. Um, so right. I uh, do have a tangential question here. Um, why use satellites? Why not use commercial aircraft that are flying over the globe all the time? Um, and my second question is, is it just visual stuff? Do you do infrared? Do you do radar, topology? Things like that? Do you share that? There are lots of reasons to use satellites. <laughs> I mean, you can augment it. You know, think how many times a commercial flight flies over. You can augment it with that, and so you wouldn't need so many satellites. That should be a lot cheaper. Well, so a couple of things. Planes are expensive. Fuels to, to, to fuel planes are expensive. Well, you get it for free because they're always flying overhead. Well, the thing is, planes can't go everywhere, right? And they, they can do a great job in lots of places, and you see that. Um, but there's lots of places they can't go. That's one. And then the other thing is, it's not just about taking a picture. It's about what's more granular in there, and what are the other ways that I can leverage this information. <coughs> you know, it depends on what you do. I mean, not all claims are necessarily going to be able to capture that. But what I will say is that there are a lot more new sources coming. That's where we're talking about the microsatellites, um, in addition to kind of the big, beautiful, amazingly sophisticated satellites Digital Globe does. <laughs> but the fact is, is that you know it is a combination of all of that. But you're not going to have one source that's going to do it all. Um, and I think you know I won't spend too much time plugging Digital Globe. But I mean, I think if you look at, you know, I think it was uh, Lou had up there the kind of constellation of all different kinds of satellites we have. There's, there, they do different things. You know, they're not just taking a picture every single time. And there are many, many different ways in which industries, whether they're in, you know, mining or agriculture, or transportation, logistics, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on behind all of that, which is of value. And so, it's, I think that there's room for a lot of different kind of industry. That's the exciting part. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Great. Adriana, thank you very much for for being on the panel. I like, just also like Tyler, Mark, uh, Raji, and, and Goats. His spirit is here. Uh, <laughs> and he left us in no time. longer here. And he, and he left us in time. Uh, well, and we, I had an applause for the. And again, uh, thanks to the folks from Digital Globe, uh, Luke, Luke and Shai were awesome. And thanks to Tina for, for teaming up with me to do this for you guys. Um, there's more food and stuff outside, so see you. Thank you. Yeah, it's like mid-March.